Hello, I'm the Reverend Sarah Facemeyer Lamb, pastor of Wayside United Methodist Church in Vienna, West Virginia, and also pastor of Sand Hill United Methodist Church in Boaz, West Virginia. Our gospel lesson today is from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Usually by now, um, our family, my husband Dave, and, and, and our families uh, would have started making plans for Christmas. My parents and Dave's parents would be asking questions like, when are you coming in? How long will you get to stay? What do you plan to do while you're here? It seems that it takes longer for our families to make plans now that there are more of us. Dave, my husband Dave and I, we have kids and our siblings have kids. Some of our siblings even have grandchildren. When Dave and I were dating and later newly married, pre-kids, it was pretty simple. We looked forward to getting together with his family at his Aunt Suge's for Christmas. Suge has been gone for 15 years, but she continues to influence how our family gives gifts. 
It was so important to Shug that she spent exactly the same amount on everyone's gift. So she would buy the presents for everyone and then whoever had the most expensive gift, well, they had their gift beautifully wrapped to unwrap. The other people had their gift and then however much money that it took to even things out. She would include a, a $10 bill or, or $5 or even a single and some change. Aunt Shug wanted everything to be equal and fair. We like fair, don't we? Merriam-Webster defines fair as agreeing with what is thought to be right or acceptable, conforming with the established rules, treating people in a way that does not favor some over others, not too harsh or critical. How often have we said or heard someone else say, that's not fair. I find myself saying and thinking those words, that's not fair, fairly often. It's not fair that bad things happen to good people, to godly people. And then good things happen to mean and selfish people. It's not fair that some people work so hard for so little. And some people barely work at all or don't work and are rewarded with so much. It's not fair when powerful, corrupt companies keep getting ahead and honest, good people are taken advantage of. It's not fair. And I know life's not fair. That was one of my dad's favorite pieces of advice. One of uh, his favorite pieces of wisdom that he passed on to me. Jesus tells a story about a landowner who hires laborers to work in his vineyard. And before the day is over, some of the workers are grumbling. That's not fair. In first century Palestine, the work day was sun up to sundown, a 12 hour day. Workers were paid a denarius a day. How much was a denarius worth? We don't know. We, we just know that it was a day's wage for a laborer. Early in the morning around 6 a.m., the landowner went to the marketplace where workers stood around waiting to be hired. The landowner and the first group of workers came to an agreement on what the daily wage would be. The sense of the Greek, symphonesis, implies they came to an agreement after bargaining. The landowner went back out at about 9 a.m. and he saw people standing around not doing anything. And so he told them to go to work in his vineyard and he would pay them what was right what was fair and they went he did this again at noon and at three and then at 5 p.m he went out one more time there was a group there that hadn't done anything all day and the land landowner asks them why are you standing here idle all day? 
And they answer, because no one has hired us. We don't know why no one hired them. Were they lazy, unreliable, old, weak, too young, injured, or just overlooked? Whatever their situation, the vineyard owner sends them to work as well. We have the first group of workers that started around 6 a.m. They bargained for their daily wage. The second group of workers started at 9 a.m. and they were told that they would be paid what was right, what was fair. So three quarters of a day's wage. And then those who started working at noon, what would be right or fair for them? Half a day's wage. And those who started at three, maybe would get a quarter of a day's pay. What about those who started work at 5 p.m.? They put in an hour of work. So would it be fair to pay them a twelfth of a day's wage? The owner of the vineyard tells his manager to pay the workers. And the 5 p.m. group is paid first. And they are paid a, full's day, a full day's wage. The early morning group, the first ones to go to work that day. You know what they're thinking. Woohoo! This is going to be some payday. If that group that worked only one hour was paid a whole day's wage, how much more will we receive? since we've put in a whole day of labor. But when the 6 a.m. crowd is paid, it's the same as those who only worked an hour and they grumbled against the landowner. We worked all day, even in the scorching heat of the sun. And that's all we get? That's not fair. We understand why they're upset, don't we? It doesn't seem fair. Surely the 6 a.m. all-day laborers have earned more than the one-hour wonders. Shouldn't they get what they deserve, what they've earned? Haven't they earned more since they worked the longest? The landowner explains to the upset 6 a.m. group. First of all, I paid you the wage that we agreed upon. You want what you've earned. You earned a day's wage. Secondly, my money, it's mine. I decide what to do with what is mine. If I decide to be generous, how does that harm you. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Like this landowner. Is the landowner fair? Fair according to whose standards? He is better than fair. He is generous. He is full of grace. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It's getting what we don't deserve. 
in a good way. Because really, what do we deserve? Who among us is perfect, always does the right thing, always follows God's will, never messes up, never sins? If anyone just said or thought, well, that's me, then you lied, and lying is a sin. Not one of us is perfect in knowing and doing the will of God. We all sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. And what do we deserve? What have we earned through our sin? Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 8. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. From Romans chapter 10. And then from Romans 5, 1. We have been made right in God's sight by faith. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Just as there were some vineyard workers who were greatly upset at the generosity of the landowner, there are some Christians who are upset at the generous nature of God's grace. Like the plumber who asked the preacher, if Hitler prayed for forgiveness from God before he died, if he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, would God forgive him? Would he get to go to heaven? The preacher answered, well, if he was truly repentant, and I would trust God to judge that, then the answer is yes, God would forgive him. And the man turned bright red and yelled, that's not fair. That's just not fair. In today's parable, there were workers who were upset at the landowner's generosity. There were also those who were thankful. I can relate. Can you? I am thankful for God's generosity, for God's grace. I am thankful that God deals with me not according to what I have done or what I deserve or what I have earned, but that God deals with me according to God's goodness and according to what Jesus has done for me. Brothers and sisters, let us be those who live in gratitude for the amazing grace that God pours out upon us. And let us be those who extend God's grace to others. What does it look like to extend grace to others? Looking for the good in people instead of instantly assuming the bad. Looking for and pointing out others' strengths. Pointing out others' accomplishments. Good points rather than focusing on their faults and failures. Speaking words of encouragement rather than words of judgment and discouragement. Seeking to build others up rather than tearing them down. Being quick to forgive, not keeping score, 
not being afraid to say, I am sorry and I was wrong. Extending grace doesn't mean we excuse another's sin or we allow them to take advantage of us. But a part of extending grace is knowing that no one is completely defined by their sin. It's being able to look beyond the sin of another and to see someone made in the image of God with the potential to be more than they presently are. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you that you deal with us not according to our goodness, but according to your goodness. We thank you that you deal with us not according to what we do, but according to what Jesus has done for us. Holy God, we don't deserve your love and your forgiveness, but you love us and forgive us. Help us to be a people of grace. Help us to be those who extend the grace that we've received to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now receive this blessing with words from Ephesians chapter 319. Go in peace, and may you know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Amen.